morning all. I'm in the garden today because we have a very rare sunny day. So 80 watt solar panel connected to my maximum power point tracking test rig. There's also a 100 watt bulb on the battery there just to hold the voltage down so that it can never go over um, a safe voltage in, um, inverter there. And then on the test rig I've got my outdoor scope. It's the one which you can see the display in sunlight. Now on the test rig I've got the new bigger inductor. This is with the very large uh, ferrite core. I found some thick enamel copper wire so I've wound that inductor and it all works. I can uh, raise the PWM percentage to somewhere between 70-80% and I'm maxing out on power and getting a little bit of gain, 40 watts at 100%. The sun's going in at the moment, 36 watts at 100%. And a bit more than that at sort of 75%. Now the point of putting this bigger inductor on was to enable the charge entering the inductor to be stored for the full cycle. Um, you can see there that the PWM is at about 80%. It's 80% high. Uh, about 20% low. Now if I start moving that you can see that at this point it breaks up and we get ringing but this ringing unlike the smaller inductor this ringing is pretty much the full swing of voltage that's a lot of volts of ringing so I thought this is probably transmitting radio frequency so I brought out my AM radio to see what I can hear and the results are well interesting the first thing I have to do is switch off this inverter because that chucks out a fair bit of noise itself. Just mains hum really. So let's turn that off. That's giving me a nice clear signal. Okay, now let's see what the MPVT is pushing out. Now this caught me out at first. There's a lot more general oscillating. All these uh, peculiar oscillations. There's a lot more of that when we've got a square wave. And I suppose that makes sense really. If I retweak this for a sine wave, then there's a lot less on the on the radio. It's actually pretty clean. Now I don't know a huge amount about RF, but um, here are my 15 kilohertz points here. So this, with a lot of ringing, it's a bit like um, a sine wave, almost a pure sine wave there, with a frequency of about, what would you say, 100 kilohertz, something like that. And of course that's off the AM wave band, so there's no pure tone coming through onto the radio. Now of course if you re-tweak this for that, it's a square wave, and a square wave contains all the harmonics up to quite high frequencies. And so, of course, it's now in the wave band of the radio. Well, that's what I'm assuming anyway, my limited knowledge of RF. Now, apologies if this is quite a noisy video. I know from the playback that I'm getting quite a lot of 15 kilohertz uh, coming through onto the camera. Um, I think it is time now to raise the frequency of this, even though these opto isolators don't seem to uh, want to go much higher than this frequency. But maybe if I take it up to 17 or 18, that probably be even more annoying for some young people, but for us oldies that won't bother us too much, we won't hear that. But I am really disappointed that this bigger inductor doesn't seem to have helped this ringing at all. In fact, if anything, it's slightly worse. I seem to remember on the old inductor that it didn't kick in um, until about 50%. But here it's kicking in at over 50% mark space. And the oscillations are enormous. So this inductor, no help. Now I do have another of these ferrites and I was wondering, probably counterintuitively, whether having fewer turns on there might be uh, an idea. It would, in theory, should give me a lower inductance, but I'm willing to try anything. Now, fast forward to the next day, Monday. Um, a very grim, cloudy day actually, so no, not much point going outside. But I thought I'd check these two inductors. This is the original one I had in the MPPT and this was the new one I wound. You can see the size difference there. I thought I'd check them in my component tester. So let's put the smaller one in. 
Uh, okay, switch this on, and it says uh, 0.2 ohms and 0.11 millihenries. So what's that? 110 microhenries. I'll just write that down. And uh, now the big one, which really didn't seem to help the project much. I thought this was going to be a lot better. So let's see what this is. I mean, it's got, what, same number of turns, actually probably fewer on this. So is it a lower inductance? Who knows? Let's give it a try. Uh, 0.2 ohms again, which is surprising because this is much thicker wire. Uh, 5.26 millihenries. F that's hugely different to that. 5.26 millihenries, that's... What if it was 10 millihenries? That's like 50 times the amount of inductance of that one. That's weird, I don't understand that. Actually, I've just run this again and it's now saying it's 11 millihenries. So I'm not sure whether this component tester likes this massive inductor very much, but... Um, so that's a hundred times. I'm going to have to write this down. Yeah, so uh, the small one is 110 microhenries and the big one is 11 millihenries. I've just done it again and it seems to be fairly consistent now with its 11 millihenries. Not quite sure what happened on that first one. Yeah, 11 millihenries, 0.2 ohms. And that's given me an idea. I mean, if this has such an enormous inductance, perhaps uh, this number of turns is unnecessary and I could wind, because uh, I've got another of these green ferrites, I could wind this with far fewer turns. That would be much better in terms of power transfer, because this would have a much lower resistance. And uh, match the inductance. Well, I mean, I don't have to probably wind one turn around here to match the inductance of this small one. So, yes, I'm very confused. I don't think I really understand inductors. Uh, so here's the other ferrite. Uh, similar to this one, and here's the wire I found, which I can use to wind uh, this other ferrite. And I'm going to just do it with, I don't know, half a dozen turns or something, just to see what the effect is. I've got uh, some more of these as well. So I'll wind that, and then when we get the next sunny day, um, I'll see what the effect is. And, you know, with these terminals, I can uh, quickly replace them and interchange them and, and go through each of the inductor types, just seeing how they affect performance of the MPPT. Anyway, back to yesterday. Now there's something else that's not working particularly well on this unit. If I switch it from manual, there's an M up there on the display, into auto just by putting it to zero, it takes a long, long time for it to get out of this low wattage area and push itself up into the, um, the higher wattage area. And I think I know why this is. It's just but here it goes. So it's now locking on to maximum power point and tracking it as well. Um, I think it's because at the low watt area, the noise coming particularly from the um, amp meter, the ammeter there, is so high that it can't actually detect whether adjustments in PWM are resulting in useful uh, variations in power in watts because there's just so much noise on the watt reading. So it's just hovering around, constantly changing its mind about which direction it should be traveling. Now I've read a lot about uh, MPPT uh, charge controllers using a perturb and observe algorithm, and it was always my intention to kind of follow that. So you'd make a small adjustment to the PWM, you'd observe uh, what change that had to the total power, and then you'd correct uh, based on which direction you're going, how close you're getting to maximum power. But that's not really how this one works. You can see from the display updates, which are really quite fast, that the software loop in the microcontroller is running at that speed very, very quickly. And there isn't time to assess the effect of making a change to PWM uh, in how much increased power you're getting. So in fact, this works in a very different way. I'm not even sure if this is a hill climbing algorithm either. Uh, let me try and explain how it works. Imagine this is the hill, the top of this inductor is maximum power. 
what my software does is it constantly walks the PWM away from the maximum power point in either one direction or the other and it just keeps going until it detects uh, a change in power that is recognizably the wrong way and then it just reverses this walking so it will then walk the other way detect that the power is dropping off and then change the direction again and my system just constantly changes the direction based on detecting falling power it's not so much a hill climbing algorithm as a not falling off the top of a hill algorithm but it does work and it tracks reasonably well once the thing can get started get out of this noise area and get into an area where um, it, it can see that there are changes in power there's a fairly simple solution to this problem there it is coming up finally this problem of this slow tracking and that is not to start at the zero end I mean what uh, what I do here is zero is my automatic uh, switch now what I should do is when it sees that there's a change from manual to automatic it should put the PWM at about 50% well outside the low uh, PWM range and it would then track from the 50% point up to sort of 70 or 80% where you actually do get maximum power so that would be a relatively easy change I could make to the software to make it do that now this is a hugely frustrating project to work on because it requires this stuff, sunshine, which we get so little of. I mean, it's an absolutely glorious day today, 25 degrees, and from 3 p.m. it's going to be sunny all afternoon, and I'm going out this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, when I'm free, mm, nothing doing there, Tuesday, there's some sunshine between 6 and 7 a.m., no thanks. Wednesday, ah, back to raining again. Very difficult working on this project in the UK weather. And that's it, I'm afraid. I'm out of time. I've got to pack all this stuff away. But uh, the next opportunity I get to uh, bring this system back out when it's sunny and reasonably warm, I will. But uh, for the moment, cheerio.